do you feel the decommunization? What it, does it mean for you in person? Decommunization. Yeah. As a historian, I think my, my instinct is always to be to dislike any kind of laws about legislation of history, you know, in my country, in anybody else's country. But I think that that's probably true for anybody that in your own field you want freedom. You want freedom for yourself. Um, and I was involved to some extent in the discussions in Poland about various decommunization laws, in particular one in 2007 that made it, uh, made it a crime punishable by up to three years of imprisonment for anyone who, who quote unquote uh, imputes to the Polish nation complicity in the crimes of, of Stalinism or of communism or of Nazism. Um, and of course that was a kind of impossible situation because everybody who, who lived through that experience you know, was for the most part implicated in some way. I mean, everybody was, was both a victim and an oppressor, or I would say most people were in some ways both victims and oppressors. Building a new society is about, is about taking responsibility and about accepting agency. I think there was a feeling that people had in 1989 or in 1991 that communism is over or the Soviet Union has collapsed and the wicked witch is dead and now we throw open the doors to the archives, we discover the truth, and we all bask in the light of truth. You know, now that we are all going to live in truth, as Havel liked to say, now we are going to live happily ever after because the dark secrets you know, about guilt and innocence will be released. But of course what happened when people opened the archives was that truth turned out to be not something that one really enjoyed basking in. Because what the communist archives were, were something much closer to what the unconscious was for Freud. So for Freud, the unconscious was a kind of dark psychic closet into which everything too disturbing for the conscious mind was thrown. And what Freud understood was that when you start coaxing the contents of that dark psychic closet into consciousness, it might be healthy, but it's not going to be pleasant. It's not going to be nice. It's going to be deeply painful and ambivalent and enormous amounts of work. And the opening of the archives has been much more like the Freudian probing open, prying open of the unconscious than it has been like a tale of the wicked witch being dead and we all live happily ever after. People who had both light and dark and good and bad sides of their personality and of their biography play major historical roles all the time. Decommunization mm -hmm. or Maidan perception mm -hmm. on others. Uh, if we are talking about different social groups is it possible to find like a general approach to all these groups or we need to work in some other way? Well, I will say one of, I thought the most insightful things I read about decommunization, which was in fact, it was not about decommunization laws, but about the Leninopod. Um, it was by a, a young Ukrainian translator named, named Nelia Varkovska. And she was writing about the town, this was during the Maidan, or maybe right at the end of the Maidan. She published it, I think, maybe March or April 2014. Um, and she was writing about the, this, the small town where her parents were from and how her mother was describing to her the taking down of the Lenin statue and the, the sadness in her voice. And I think what, what Nellie was trying to describe was not that these were communists, you know, who wanted to reimpose communism or who didn't want to see a future, but you were taking away the places where they, they arranged to meet the first boy they kissed when they were 14 years old. You know, you're, you're stealing somebody's biography in a way or their, their memories or the, the places that they knew and the streets that they knew in a world that was familiar to them. And it then becomes very difficult in these discussions about decommunization to disentangle, you know, having an open discussion about the crimes of Stalinism, which are, are irrefutable. Um, and I, I, I think there are moments at which there's very little space for ambivalence about some of those crimes. You know, there's very little space to make excuses for the famine. There's very little space to make excuses for the purges. But, and the parts of people's worlds that are simply intertwined with their biographies. 
you know, what does it mean for people, especially people who are older, you know, to wake up in a city in which they don't recognize the names of the streets and therefore they don't know where they are and they no longer recognize their landmarks and they can't go to the spot where they used to meet their girlfriend or their boyfriend. And I think that that very human level that is perhaps transcendent of the political, there needs to be some sensitivity to that. But these are people's lives. I mean, you can't tell them that 70 years of their life was a mistake and has to be erased. And you can try to have an open, painful discussion about the moral compromises that people made, you know, and the ways in which people found themselves in situations that, uh, that caused suffering to other people. But it's very hard to legislate in such a way that makes people feel that you're stealing their own history from them, their personal history. And that, that relationship between the public sphere and the private sphere is something that perhaps needs, needs to be given more attention. But I'm not convinced that there's a way you can legislate from above that will make it any better or will make it less painful or, or will make it okay. It can't be made okay. Ukraine is full of an extraordinary number of very talented people who of course <laughs> should be able to overcome everything because I'm continually so impressed with the new generation of students and the questions they ask and the energy they bring.